All right, cool. Well, um, we'll officially get started here. Uh, my name is Bev Reed, and I'm an Ohio Valley resident and a leader with Concerned Ohio River residents. And we're here to talk tonight about the proposed Mountaineer underground natural gas liquid storage facility proposed for uh, Monroe County, Ohio, and the associated infrastructure um, like the PTTG ethane cracker plant. And so those are the two facilities we're going to be focusing on tonight. So we also want to give some background info and an update on these facilities to give context to the discussion. So ethane is first extracted from the earth in a process called hydraulic fracturing or fracking. Millions of gallons of fresh water are used every day and millions of gallons of toxic chemicals are injected into the earth in order for the gas to be produced. The water that comes back up from the fracking process often contains high levels of radioactivity and is polluted with heavy metals, chemicals, and lots of salt. The wastewater is typically injected back underground and the solids are sent to landfills, oftentimes to landfills that are not equipped to handle the radioactivity levels that they contain. Methane, one of the gases that is produced, is used for things like home heating and cooking. And these, faci these facilities we are talking about today, however, would not be producing energy. An ethane cracker plant essentially takes ethane, a gas that is more wet in nature, and cracks it into different molecules. There is also a process called polymerization that occurs within the plant and the end product is tiny plastic beads or nurdles. Here are the nurdles if you've never seen them. <clears throat> These nurdles then go on to other facilities that melt them down and mold them into various plastic products. The most common use for the type of plastic that would be created at the PTTGC cracker is single use products such as plastic bags and bottles. PTT Global Chemical is the name of the company behind the plant and they are Thailand based. They got their permits and then let them expire around 2015. Hardly anyone in the community knew about these plans back then. Then in 2018, PTTGC signed a partnership agreement with Dalem Chemical USA, a South Korean petrochemical company, and they got new environmental permits from the Ohio Environmental Protection Agency in 2018. Since that time, the company has announced delay after delay of their final investment decision. The most recent delay came on July 14th when Dalem Chemical pulled out of the project. They cited the pandemic and recent oil price volatility as reasons to why they have delayed this time. They have pushed their potential investment decision to the end of this year or early next year, first quarter next year. That's what it says on their website. Although the companies blame immediate issues for the delay, many economic experts weighed in on the matter, disputing the claims. And lastly, for my section here, uh, with regard to the relationship between the Cracker and the Mountaineer storage facility, it states on PTTG's website that the Mountaineer NGL storage would provide certain necessary infrastructure for the plant. Economic experts have suggested that the two projects would need each other to exist. It was announced on July 22nd that PTTGC has entered into a precedent agreement with uh, the company, with Energy Storage Ventures LLC through its wholly owned subsidiary Mountaineer NGL Storage. This essentially means that if the projects were to move forward, the two companies would partner with one another. Again, despite this recent announcement being in the news, we have much reason to believe these projects are unlikely to move forward at all. It is still important to share the facts, however, and the risks of the proposed facilities. And I'll now kick it over to Alex Cole with OVEC. Um, he's traveled the area often and will share with you his research and experience. All right, yeah. Uh, as Bev said, my name is Alex Cole. I work for the Ohio Valley Environmental Coalition. Uh, we're an environmental nonprofit headquartered in Huntington, West Virginia, downriver from all of this. As Bev mentioned, this is what we're going to be focusing on. Let me get a pointer here. We're going to be focusing on the Mountaineer Storage Facility, and, and she already mentioned the association to PTTG, but I just wanted to expand out the view, you know, at first to let everybody truly understand that this is a plan, this is a piece of a much larger plan to make the entire region a petrochemical corridor and the storage is a key fundamental piece that they need to make all the other stuff happen. This is a map 
of a geological survey that WVU, um, Brian Anderson in particular, did for the industry to uh, survey the, the, the geological potential for underground storage in the region. These three blue circles are, are places where they identified storage potential. Down here around my neck of the woods in Putnam County and Jackson County, this is an underground uh, former gas field that could be used as storage. But right here, we're looking at these red circles. These are salt domes. So this is what's going, this is the, the geological structures that they are interested in storing. And we're focusing right on this little small red circle here. This is the first one that they intend to develop. Uh, here on the left, natural gas coming out of the ground, processing plants to remove the methane from the rest of the natural gas liquids, fractionator that removes the natural gas liquids into their separate, uh, you know, propane, butane, ethane, uh, isobutane, there's several. We're going to be focusing on the storage component. And as I said, this is a key storage or the key component to the whole process because they need storage in the area to build more methane or ethane crackers like Royal Dutch Shell or PTTG or many others that they, they want to build. So this storage component is kind of a, a key. Without it, the rest uh, is less likely to happen. Uh, I'm going to start with this video. Uh, and this is an industry video of how the process actually works. This will give you a better idea of what is that, what would actually happen underground if they were to build this. A proven practice with a history dating back to the early 1950s, salt cavern storage is the process of excavating caverns in subterranean salt deposits for the use of storing vast quantities of liquid petroleum gas or natural gas. The process begins with the wellbore construction for long-term durability in NGL storage. To start, an initial borehole of 40 inches is created. Then, a 36-inch diameter surface casing is installed in the borehole to a depth of approximately 200 feet and cemented to the surface. This casing is the first protection for any freshwater source. A second casing of 30 inches in diameter is then installed in the 34-inch borehole to a depth of approximately 320 feet and cemented to the surface. The third step in the process is the creation of a 24-inch borehole to a depth of approximately 2,000 feet true vertical depth. A 20-inch diameter intermediate casing is then installed and cemented to the surface. This intermediate casing protects the well from any shallow oil and gas activities in the area. A 17 and a half inch borehole is then created to a depth of approximately 6,410 feet true vertical depth. And the final production casing of 13 and 3 eighths inch diameter is installed and cemented to the surface. This production casing serves as the final protection for salt and storage caverns. To assure integrity of the well, a cement bond log must be run subsequent to the cementing of the production casing. In addition, the production casing is pressure tested to at least 900 psi prior to drilling out the cement. The final step in the wellbore construction process is to set the 10 and 3 quarter inch and 7 inch suspended mining strips. Once the wellbore construction is complete, fresh water will be pumped down the 7 inch mining strip and the saturated salt water will return to the surface through the annulus between the 10 and 3 quarter inch casing and the 7 inch mining strip. The cavern growth is controlled by the rate of fresh water being delivered and the level of the 10 and 3 quarter inch casing is being set into the salt. This will leave a salt roof in the cavern. The salt roof is a layer of protection to prevent any migration or loss of product. After the cavern is developed to the desired capacity, there is a void left filled with saturated salt water. An above ground salt water impoundment structure is located near the well. The impoundment structure has more than enough volume to hold the total capacity of the newly formed cavern, so there is never a chance of overfilling the structure. Now operational, NGL will be received 
from pipelines, rail cars, or trucks. As the product arrives, it will be injected into the wellhead and down through the annulus into the top of the capper. The product is injected at enough pressure to force the brine up through the mining stream and into the water environment structure. To deliver the NGL product back to the surface, the salt water from the impoundment structure is pumped back into the wellhead and down the mining stream. The pressure of the salt water then forces the product out of the cavern through the annulus to the surface and into the tanks or pipelines to be delivered to customers as desired. Key points I would like to highlight there is the salt water uh, lake, the, the, the impoundment that they need to build to keep the water on hand. That is because they always have to keep this structure at a balance of pressure for it to hold up the roof. So as they pump gas in, liquefied natural gas, in this case, ethane in or out, they also have to pump water in or out to maintain structures, that structure under a pressure to keep the roof from caving in. And we'll talk more about this later. This blue, Rectangle is where uh, the Powhatan Salt Company and Mountaineer Storage Ventures intends to build this. Notice Clarington, Ohio, right below, and of course Moundsville up here, the proposed site of PTTG. As was mentioned in there, a lot of the stuff comes from pipelines and trucks and river barges and whatnot, but there will have to be multiple pop pipelines run up and down the river during in this section. Uh, one, to get ethane to PTTG if both are built, but also multiple feeder pipelines running from fractionators. This is the Blue Racer Midstream. Let me get a pointer. Blue Racer Midstream here in Natrium on the West Virginia side of the river is one of the primary ones that is supposed to feed uh, Mountaineer. They're about, uh, I think I looked up about two and a half miles apart, straight line. There is also plans for some of the brine solution to be piped to Westlake Chemical right here also in Natrium for uh, making chlorine chemicals. So yeah, multiple pipelines going both ways and crossing the river multiple times with multiple toxic and explosive contents. This is a video and I am gonna, this is the before video and this is uh, what the, the place looks like now. And again, I hope uh, people are familiar with the region. I, there is no audio and I'm going to talk over it and narrate. So this is as if you're traveling south on Route 7, uh, again, just above uh, Clarington. Uh, the river is on your left. I want you to notice this little gravel road to the left because it is a good landmark for the next video. Uh, but obviously Route 7 right here, Ohio River to the left. I'm about to turn and you will see a, mount, a strip mine on the hillside above. That, that's one aspect of this that is worrisome. There is a strip mine and also already acid mine drainage coming off of this property. Uh, there is also underground mines very close by. I don't know if they run particularly under this property. On top of this strip mine that you're about to see, it's, it's covered over in brush. But since I took this video, there's been uh, drilling activity on top of that fill to your, now to your left. Uh, there is a fracked well on top of that hill, right over top of all this. And you'll, you, what could go wrong, you know? Uh, we will see here in a second. So that's before, and this is after. This is another industry video. Uh, again, traveling south on seven, West Virginia, hills on your left, along with the Ohio River. Notice the rail cars a bit. The, probably the most visible aspect of this will be the rail yard, uh, but you're about to see that that impoundment structure we're talking about is on your right right now. That is a dam. That's not the hillside. But really above ground structures, the, the, the impoundment and the rail yard. And then other than that, it's, it's going to look very minimal on the surface. It's, it's drill, it, it's uh, wells. So that little concrete pad is in the video before the strip mine up to your right. 
again, there's a fracked well that they just drilled on that strip mine. There in this video, they show a little uh, drill up on the hill there. And this is the impoundment. And this impoundment, the toe of this dam will be, is in the floodplain. That's that the Ohio River has been that high before. It will be that high again. And then this is super salinated water. If this dam would give way, there's, there's millions of gallons of super salinated water going into the Ohio River. And I failed to mention up until this point, but the Ohio River is drinking water source for 5.5 million people. It, it, this, is, this is a big deal. This, this is, you know, beyond any environmental impact of just plants and wildlife and the health of the river, this is 5 million people's drinking water. And they want to put that lake of salt water plus build a cabin, a cavern under the river to store highly toxic and explosive natural gas liquids. So again, I think my presentation should have been entitled What Could Go Wrong? <laughs> a lot, a lot of things. And you're about to see, this is the Bayou Corn sinkhole in Assumption, Paris, Louisiana. Parish, I always do that. Louisiana, it first formed in 2012. And when it was first noticed, it was about 2.5 acres uh, in area. It was a salt cavern and it was storing butane at the time. Uh, one, inter one interesting tidbit about this is their salt formations are about two and a half miles under bedrock from the surface. Two and a half miles deep is the top of the salt dome here that collapsed. Ours, that is under the Ohio River there, is about a mile and a quarter, so half as deep. And this one caved in um, about 25 million cubic feet of butane had to be burnt off. Uh, that is not nearly what, that is not nearly all that was stored in here. Uh, third, by the time of currently, the sinkhole has grown to 37 acres and bubbling is still seen for miles around. You, you don't want to think about this as like a collapse, like a like a an instantaneous thing where the butane would just be released in a bubble. Think of a slow collapse of cracks and fissures and geysers, literally geysers of, of methane and water bubbling up. Because again, these things are under pressure and they're maintained under a pressure. So the burning off of 25 million cubic feet was just trying to release pressure and that's as much as they could burn off. The rest is still bubbling out of the ground. And you know, I mentioned that fracking well on top of that hill for a reason. And if you live in the area, you know, the, the place is already littered with fracking wells. This turns out was caused by a puncture by a, a nearby oil well, punctured the side wall of this salt cavern and it collapsed. 350 residents had to be evacuated. Many were just bought out. There is no way to fix this. There is no way. It's two and a half miles deep. It is everything over top of that crumbling. It's probably going to keep growing. Like this is just going to be this way forever. Like there, there is no solution, <laughs> you know. Uh, the next one I'd like to talk about, this is Aliso Canyon. You might have caught this in the news. This is an easy, uh, interesting one because it happened in Los Angeles in a relatively wealthy suburb in 2016. There's a, there's, there's a pretty good documentary on Netflix about it. Uh, this was SoCal Gas's storage for methane, household methane. Uh, it's a little different than a salt cavern but it's the same well structure. You saw the majority of that video was just about the well casings. This uh, is a depleted gas field that they then pumped methane back into for storage. It leaked for four months. Nine, 97,000 tons of methane leaked, 7,300 tons of ethane. You'll see in, if you watch the documentary, they didn't tell people living in the valley down below how bad this was. Complaints had to come in. People got sick, not just from the methane, but breathing the odorant that they add to the methane, the stuff that makes natural gas smell like rotten eggs. 
That's how people noticed. They had to move schools, all kinds of crazy stuff. And again, this was caused by a blowout, a cracked well casing, and it leaked for four months. What happened here, and this is very, very comparable to what's going, what they want to do in Clarington, a methane leaked through a well casing crack into a permeable layer and found another brine cavern. And when they mixed, they both exploded. It killed two people, destroyed a trailer park, two downtown businesses just burnt down, uh, damaged 26 other businesses. And same as the, the uh, Bayou Corn incident, sinkholes, gas leaks, geysers, just random. They actually had to get satellites in there and in space to look at this from above and search out leaks as they popped up all around the place. So the city's still dealing with the fallout from this. And again, this is a map similar to the first, but this is to point out, this is just a five mile radius from the storage. And Natrium and Westlake, all those chemical plants are right here too, within that five miles. So that's just to give you an idea of the area of impact, say if, if a simple one of these catastrophes, catastrophes might, might take place. Uh, if you remember the original map, the salt dome itself is, a, is even larger than this. So any potential collapse that could happen, you know, someone way over here in Marshall or Tyler County, West Virginia, could be dealing with this. You see this is a statewide map uh, of all the mines in the state of Ohio that they are aware of. And this is the proposed site of Mountaineer storage. Uh, if you saw in the videos, that surface mine that I talked about, that is this green blob here. And these are actually the coal cleaning ponds that uh, were associated with that mine here. This is the site of the Mountaineer storage we've been talking about through the whole presentation. This is actually the site of the brine pond that they want to build. And if you'll notice here, these little squares are abandoned mine openings. So there are two abandoned mine openings under the proposed brine pond. What could go wrong there? And these, again, this green blob is surface mines, but these squares are mine openings. And if you look at the bigger picture, this weird orange area with hash marks, is an abandoned underground mine. This is a long wall mine. I, I believe uh, just, uh, I believe these mine openings are for this long wall mine. And if you're unfamiliar with what a long wall mine is, that is when they uh, take a, a large machine underground that just burrows and it cuts a long wall into the coal seam and just walks along that coal seam and lets the roof collapse and subside behind the coal seam. As they just dig it out, they take the whole seam and the top of the mine collapses behind it. And that leads to all kinds of, again, subsidence issues and cracks. And of course, in all the uh, rock layers above the coal seam. So this, this, they want to build this storage facility literally on top of two mine openings. Uh, well, the, the brine pond on top of two mine openings, the actual storage itself under all these subsidence issues. Again, we talked about uh, collapse of these storage facilities because of geological unease. We talked too about uh, drilling potentially causing a collapse. And we know there, there was just recently a gas well drilled on top of the surface mine. There is also, if you look over here, these red blobs are underground mines and the extent of which are unknown, <laughs> partially known extent. So we, we don't know how far these underground, these are like more traditional shaft or room and pillar mines. And this is what the ODNR has on record, but they do not know how far they extend because they probably predate 
regulation. So again, and here's even another, this little circle is an abandoned mine opening for this long wall mine. So <laughs> yeah, they are building this on top of the, geologically speaking, on top of Swiss cheese, if I can be so crude about it. But just a little addendum to our presentation and we're always finding out more. Again, we found this out found this uh these maps from an ohio citizen that shared us with us shared this website with us from the odnr and just adding more uh more to the information this is just a really dumb place to build a storage facility uh what could go wrong thanks alex um i do have a few more uh facts here to share about this facility uh, the project would be in the Salina Formation. Uh, I'm not sure if you said that, Alex, but um, it's an approximately 200-acre site, one mile north of Clarington, uh, whose groundwater wells are only a mile away from the proposed storage site. Uh, and it would have a working storage capacity of 3.25 million barrels for storing ethane, butane, and propane. Um, 1.7 million gallons of water from the Ohio River each day would be used in dissolving the salt to create the caverns. Um, also, migration of radioactive toxins from this storage facility and other toxic elements into the air and water are of great concern. Um, as recently as July 29th this year, uh, the Mont Bellevue NGL storage hub in Texas um, exploded and um, people had to, uh, people in the past have had to evacuate uh, from issues having to do with this Texas facility. But again, as recently as July 29th, actually when I was researching to create the ads for this meeting, I saw that that facility had exploded and it's a similar facility. Um, they, they can have, these facilities can have significant flaring episodes with excessive emissions that can cause negative health impacts. Um, in many petrochemical plants and storage systems, flaring is used to burn off gases released by pressure relief valves when overpressuring conditions occur in plant equipment. Researchers note that gas flaring is a prominent source of carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, sulfur dioxide, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, hydrocarbons, excuse me, and smog forming volatile organic compounds, and also nitrogen oxides and soot. Um, I will kick it over to Leah. Why would we do this if we don't have to? That's the bottom line to me. Economically, it doesn't make sense. Environmentally, oh, certainly not. But economically, this does not make sense. But they're not factoring in the cleanup cost. And we're seeing this already with fracking. I just saw the article about the Bakken. And how are they going to clean that up? This, cumulati this accumulation of radioactivity in a small area near the Ohio River for only 12 jobs. And, and so if you just Google it, you'll find out your, for yourself. I don't want to have to read this whole thing. But when that brine water is cycled through the ethane storage to maintain pressure and temperature, it's going to come in contact with the radon from the ethane from the fracking, which we know is throughout the entire uh, chain is gathering radioactivity. So I'm not a rad chemist, but I'm just a lay person, but I can understand this that, you know, we really are not taking the precautions against it. And that's because, and Megan Hunter can cover that later because people have a lot of questions about why aren't we better protected from this. The experts are saying here that T-norm, which stands for technologically enhanced, uh, naturally occurring radioactive material, uh, must be cleaned uh, out of these um, this technology that they use for these facilities. And so these are highly radioactive areas uh, that we're talking about here. So again, uh, we do have some points I wanted to list really quickly here. 
Um, as Alex men mentioned, the Institute for Energy Economics and Financial Analysis, or IEFA, uh, created a research report in March 2020 before the pandemic hit, which determined that the proposed cracker has become too risky an investment to go forward. IEFA has been joined in that conclusion by Moody's, Fitch's, and IHS Market. Uh, one factor they cited is that the price of plastic is only 60% of what it was when the project was originally planned around 2010 to 2013. Um, and at the same time that prospects in our region are dwindling, competition is growing rapidly elsewhere. In just the past two years, ethylene and polyethylene production capacity in the U.S. has increased by 50%, principally along the Gulf Coast, creating a condition of oversupply that IEFA analysis doesn't see closing until 2026. The global build out is even greater with Wood Mackenzie forecasting a meteoric, meteoric expansion of ethylene capacity in China over the next five years. Um, as a result, IHS market forecast an immediate plunge in global cracker utilization rates. Um, another discouraging factor is that even before the recent coronavirus crisis and the associated economic slowdown, the financial condition of the region's gas drilling industry was dire, and the best cure for the industry's condition, a rise in natural gas prices, would further reduce the competitiveness of petrochemicals from the region by driving up the cost of the ethane feedstock. Additional barriers are presented by questions about the speed of general economic recovery and whether global and domestic demand for plastics and chemicals will meet pre-crisis expectations. Um, and also you have other uh, local and you have, you have local organizations doing it as well as uh, countries enacting measures designed to reduce plastic consumption and pollution. So that could impact the demand. 